Amen. I'd like to welcome everyone tonight, especially if you are a guest with us tonight. We are so glad to have you in service with us. Thank you for being here tonight. If you're joining us online tonight, wherever you're watching us from, we welcome you as a part of this service and pray you're blessed by it wherever you may be. And uh, I never thought I'd say this quite this way, but obviously a lot of things have changed. It's very good to have my mother in service tonight. <laughs> it's a pretty rare thing now with all of the changes, so I know she's mother right to all of you, but that's just my mom first. And I never thought the day would come that it would be a rare thing to be in service. Especially for all of us to still be in the same place. But so it's good to have her. And as I said, Bishop was going to be here but not feeling well. And so we still honor him even in his absence tonight. Praise God. Amen. Before I preach, I want to say how much I appreciate our master carpenter, Brother Sean Whaley, and his assistant. I have, in a few moments, you will see some props for my message tonight, and I want to thank them for the time they put in. Also, Esther contributed, Esther contributed until she got very, very sick Friday night, and then Sister Kimbrell stepped in to help. So I want to say thanks to them as well. Um, appreciate their help. Praise God. So, Exodus chapter 25, beginning with verse number 1. Exodus 25 and 1. There are several folks here that are extremely knowledgeable on the subject I am going to touch on tonight. And uh, I am essentially a kindergartner and they're all college level people. So that means at least, you know, you'll, you won't have trouble understanding me. Um, but I, I, I approach this subject tonight with great reverence, not only because of the subject, but knowing, I mean it very sincerely, there's several folks here that are extremely knowledgeable in this area. So, Exodus 25 and verse number 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye, ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skin dyed red and badger's skin and shy to tim wood oil for the light spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate in verse 8 and 9 say this and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. It's not really my focus, but how, what an absolutely amazing verse that the Creator says, make me someplace because I want to be with you. I want to dwell among you. And then He says, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. I want to preach to you tonight on this subject, an altar and an ark. An altar and an ark. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being in your presence tonight. We thank you for this holiday season you have brought us through, kept your hand upon us, given us time of rest and refreshment and 
spending time with family and friends. And now, God, as we begin a new year, I pray that you would continue the work you've already been doing in us as a church, in us as individuals. I pray, God, that as we launch into this new year, that on this first night, that your presence would continue to be manifested and that you would do a significant work of your spirit here tonight, God. We have no desire. We are not here to simply go through the motions and punch a clock to fulfill an obligation, but we have come to encounter you, to experience what it is you have for us, God. And so I trust you to work and move in this place tonight. Father, I depend upon you tonight for your anointing. I trust in you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The children of Israel have come out of hundreds of years of bondage in Egypt and are making their way to the promised land. And it's in the beginning of this journey, God is establishing some things, including what we have read here this evening. I want you to make me a place where I can dwell among you. I want you to make me a tabernacle because I, wanna, I want to be with you. And so part of, or one of the reasons for this tabernacle being built was exactly that. God wanted some place to dwell among his people. God's ultimate goal, which is what we experience here tonight, is not God dwelling with his people, but it is God dwelling in his people. And so that tabernacle was only a foreshadowing of us being the place where God ultimately wanted to dwell. And so, in addition to it being a place for God to dwell among his people, as he said in verse 8, there was also some principles and patterns that God was using that tabernacle to establish. There are several other parts of it, instruments in it, that I'm not touching on here tonight. I am simply going to focus on the altar and the ark. The ark was the first thing, and we will read about it in a little while. I'm going to go in reverse order, I guess. But the ark was actually the first thing God instructs, beginning in verse number 10. He instructs Moses how to build the ark, the way that he wanted the ark created. He also instructed him on the building of the table of showbread and the golden candlestick. I find it very interesting that the first three things God instructed Moses to build were the three things that were most connected to the supernatural. The table of showbread, which is representative of the Word of God, the golden candlestick, and the various spiritual implications. Those were the instruments in the tabernacle that, that, that were more about the supernatural. The other things had to do more with man's side, but those things were more about representing God's side. And so that's the first thing he tells Moses. And then in chapter number 26, God gives Moses the instructions for the area, the holy place, the holy of holies, that, that those things were supposed to be housed in. And then it's in chapter... 27 where he instructs Moses to build the brazen altar brethren would bring that please the brazen altar was to be the first instrument the first piece of furniture if you will that was encountered once you entered the outside of the tabernacle They'll do real well. I promise you they know what they're doing. And so you can really, you can watch them on the video later and just watch me for now. Or I guess I'll just stop and let's all watch them since you're a bit distracted by them. 
we won't be able to see you guys anymore. Bye-bye. Chapter 27 and verse number 1 says, And thou shalt make an altar of that wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of brass the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. So, the ark and the altar, if I could put it this way, are kind of the bookends. They're the, they're the bookends of the furniture that's to be in the tabernacle. If you, brethren, would please bring the, the uh, ark for me. The, the altar was the first thing you encountered when you entered the tabernacle. And what took place on the altar was the sacrifice of animals. And there was blood that was to be shed. There was death that took place there. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says this, The altar of burnt offering much the larger of the two, the two being the altar of incense, was set up in front of the doorway of the tabernacle where it was used for the daily burnt and meal offerings. It was there that the priests made atonement for various sins of the people according to the sacrificial system outlined in Leviticus 1 through 7. And it stood as witness... Uh, let's, I'll let them get settled because you need to get this part. The altar stood as a witness to the fact that any entry into the presence of God must be preceded by an atonement for sin. If you want to get to His presence, you've got to start at the altar. If you want to experience this, you've got to start there. Our problem today is, I was going to read it later, I'll read it to you right now. In Matthew 27 and verse 50, the scripture says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. The veil, the separation, the thing that kept God separated from man, at, the, at, the, at Jesus' death, that veil was torn so that there was now access by anybody. Because up till this point, the only person that ever got here was the high priest. The only person that ever got to experience this was the high priest. But because of what took place at Calvary, there was no more barrier and everyone now had access to get to the presence of God. The problem is just because the veil that was the, 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 the obstruction or the separation was torn, God did not do away with the pattern. He provided access for everyone, but the pattern remained the same. He did not do away with the pattern. And we are living in a religious time, a time of Christianity in which everybody wants to jump to the presence. And we want to get straight in the presence. And we want to skip over the altar because that's a bloody, messy place. And so we dress it all up and everything's lovely and fancy and wonderful. Let's skip the bleeding animals and the blood and the mess. And let's just go straight to the, to the ark where the presence is. It's not really what I've come to preach tonight, but I can't get past it for a few moments. We cannot get rid of the altar and just go straight to the presence. There is a pattern that God established when he told Moses how to build the same 
sanctuary. And that is the first thing I want you to encounter is if you want to get to me, there needs to be an altar. Something's got to die. And so we now are in a time in which ministry bypasses the altar and we just want to get everybody in the presence. When it was first established, you own, there was only one man that went here one time a year. And while it had the potential of being a great experience, it was also essentially a dangerous experience. Because there was the potential that you got into the Holy of Holies where the ark was and God didn't accept the sacrifice and you lost your lives. I think a few of us would probably be a little more serious about this if we knew that if we bypassed the altar and went straight to the presence, we might lose our lives if we didn't put some things on the altar that belong on the altar. I want you to notice something for a moment. These, these are not exactly to scale per se. But in concept, they are, they're pretty close to also demonstrating a very significant point. The altar was much larger than the ark. The altar was somewhere around seven and a half feet square. The ark was somewhere about 3.75 feet long by about 2.5 feet wide. I don't think God had it made so big on accident. And I don't think he had it made so big to begin with, so at some point you just forget about it and let's go straight to the ark. You see, this is where I get rid of anything that comes between him and me. Right here is where I deal with whatever might interfere with my relationship with him. Leviticus chapter 16 and verse 11 says this, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten smell, and bring it within the veil, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may, un may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. The other altar, what was referred to in the commentary I read a few moments ago, was that altar of incense that was in the holy place, and it was much smaller than the than the brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice. But what I want you to notice in the verses here is that altar of incense which represents prayer and represents praise and worship and things like that. A sweet aroma that comes before God. The fire for the altar of incense had a very specific source. That fire was not supposed to come from just anywhere. The fire for the altar of incense was supposed to originate from the fire from the altar of sacrifice. 
You better make sure that when you lift up holy hands and you begin to open a mouth in praise and worship that the fire has originated from an altar of sacrifice. That your praise and your worship and your prayer is not inspired by some other source, someplace else. But the fire of my praise and my prayer and my worship should be a result of fire that I got a hold of at an altar of sacrifice. So I've come tonight to preach to you about the altar because I challenge you that as we head into a new year, and I've said it before, I really don't think God is all that in concern with the turning of the calendar from December 31st to January 1. I don't think it's necessarily quite as big of a deal to Him as it is to us in most circumstances and situations. But can I challenge you, we do have have a tendency as humans that the start of a new year has some implications to it. So can I challenge you tonight, if you've got any New Year's resolutions, just go ahead and tear them up and throw them away. Don't live under the condemnation and the guilt of them for a couple of weeks or months. Throw the weight loss thing away. Throw the better. Throw all that away. Quit living under it. You're going to mess it up. Rather than a bunch of resolutions tonight, what I've come to challenge you to do tonight at the start of a new year is to put some things on the altar. Rather than trying on your own to change and fix and work out some things, I've come to challenge you to put some things on the altar. And you see, there are some things that are going on the altar that you would consider negative things, bad things, sin, disobedience, rebellion. But there's also some things you might need to put on the altar that in and of themselves there's nothing wrong with them. But for you, it's something that is a hindrance or it's coming between you and Him. And so I challenge you tonight to lay some things down and put some things on the altar. And over the next few moments, what I challenge you to do is on that piece of paper, I think if you'll just listen, if you'll just be sensitive, to the voice I believe the Spirit of God will impress upon you over the next few moments some things that might be in your life that need to go on the altar some of you've got some unforgiveness that needs to go on the altar some of you've got some anger and some hatred towards somebody that needs to go on the altar Some of you have got some addictions that need to go on the altar because whatever gets put on the altar dies. You put it on the altar so that it doesn't keep living. And some of you have got some things that are dragging you down that I'm challenging you tonight, as simple as it may be, as, as silly as it may even seem to some of you in the flesh, I'm challenging you as an act of faith to put some things on that piece of paper. And when we get done here tonight, to lay them on the altar and trust that the same thing that happened at the tabernacle naturally when they did the service of the Lord that supernaturally tonight there are some things that you are going to put on the altar and the fire of the Lord is going to consume those things so that as you and I embark on a new year we can remove whatever obstacles there may be for us to be able to get here. This next one's going to be a little tough, perhaps, but some of you need to put some promises on the altar. Said some of you need to put some promises on the altar. Because some of you are struggling 
with your walk with God right now because you've got promises from God that he's not fulfilling. You don't understand why and you're struggling, you're discouraged, you're frustrated, you're doubting, you're questioning it. It wasn't the brazen altar, but it was an altar where God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, and I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to put him on the altar. Oh, I know, I know. We all, yeah, okay, I'll put it on the altar because I know God will do the same thing to me he did to Abraham. And when I put it on the altar and walk away, I know he's going he's gonna to call me back and say, okay, now I know, and so you can have it back. I'm sorry to tell you there's no guarantee. There is no guarantee that you put it on the altar and then he says, okay, now I know. Now I know you're willing to obey me and so you can have it back. There is a chance there may be something tonight that God has calling you to put on the altar and when it's all said and done, there may be a fire that consumes it and he may not get it back. But I beg you and I challenge you tonight if there is anything that you're willing to acknowledge that might be separating you from him I'm asking you tonight by the help of the Lord put it on the altar I know this is a great we love the presence your presence is heaven to me we don't really sing much about the altar do we <laughs> What's that one we sang last night? It was about the presence too, I forget. What was that one? Yeah, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place. That's aggressive. We, I, I love those songs. We love the presence. But in 2017, I am free. I have my life. I have my will. That's what some of you need to write down right now. My W-I-L-L. -L. And at the conclusion of this message, some of you need to put your will on the altar. You need to put your will on the altar. Paul said it this way. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. See, it's... There's some songs that they don't necessarily mention the altar, but that's really what they're about. So whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord, that's what I'll be willing to do. Whatever. Here you go. I'll help somebody else out. A T T I T U D E. Some of you need to put an attitude on the altar. Oh, I know. I know it was about, you know, the lamb and atonement and all. I know that. I know that. But that's not all it was about. That's not all it was about. It was about the fact that there would be things in your life and my life that I needed to let go of. I needed to give up. The first. The first thing. It wasn't off in the corner somewhere. Can you imagine? 
I mean, the ark was a beautiful thing. The candlestick, the table of showbread, the altar of incense. I, I guess to a degree, the brazen laver probably was an attractive thing. Even, even if it was built attractively, I don't know how with a bunch of animals constantly being put on it and blood being shed, I don't think it kept its attraction. You would think the first thing to see when you enter would be something as beautiful as the ark, not the altar. I, I doubt it smelled real good. I, I doubt that the aroma from the altar of sacrifice was an appealing thing. And yet, if you wanted to get there, you had to pass by here. When's the last time, when's the last time you found yourself all by yourself in a season of repentance. I, I didn't get to preach a rah-rah vision last night, and this isn't rah-rah vision tonight. I know, boy, this is heavy after the holidays. When, when's the last time? When's the last time that rather than trying to get here to get what you needed, you stayed here? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Anything in me, God, anything in my life, whether it's sin or whether it's not sin, but if it is a separation between you and me, I want it on the altar. See, great vision, great promises, Great things that God has done, is doing, and we are expecting God to do. But your and I, your part and my part of this is to make sure we get some things on the altar. Not just rush by to get to His presence. I believe tonight God did some wonderful things last night in a different way. I believe tonight that some of you will get the answer you need when you put it on the altar. Some of you need to get that thorn that's been in your side tonight and put it on the altar. Some of you need to put a spouse on the altar. Some of you need to lay. I didn't say you put them there and kill them. I just said put them on the altar. You need to take whatever it is that's coming between him and you and put it on the altar and be willing to walk away and allow it to be completely consumed. So that was the first thing encountered. And everything about the entry into the tabernacle and what you, what you encountered in the tabernacle really all pointed to his presence. Because as we've sung here tonight, there's nothing like his presence. Going back to Exodus 25 and verse 10. And they shall make an ark 
of that wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof, and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and the two rings shall be in the one of, on the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of wood and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the side of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put it into the ark, the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end, even on the mercy even oh even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two side, two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee all of that for this there there will I meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two, two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. I want you to do all of that because this is going to be the focal point of my presence and where I'm going to meet with you. How amazing that God wanted all of this to be done simply so he could have a place to meet with us. God was the initiator of the place for us to be able to meet with Him. It wasn't a man originated idea. It wasn't a result of human desire. But God reached down and said, I want to be among you. I want to be with you. And I want you to create a place that is going to be the focal point of where I will meet with you. Can I tell you, I think perhaps the biggest, if not one of the biggest, possibly the biggest problem we're facing in Christianity today is a lack of the presence. When you've got the presence of God, when the presence of God is present and being manifested, you don't need to try to figure out how to entertain people. You don't need to have to try to figure out how to hold everybody's attention. You don't have to have lights and video and all of those things to hold people's attention. You use them as a side help, as just a, as an addition, not the focus. You don't need smoke and lights when you got the presence presence so now we've got to do all kind of things to hide the fact that we don't have the presence because if people find out you've got the presence and they can experience the presence there is something on the inside of humanity that when it connects with its creator something is awakened in them Moses had an understanding of the significance of the presence of God. He said in chapter 33, verse 20, 
verse 12, Moses said unto the Lord, See thou mayest, see thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. And consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. And now listen to what Moses responds and says to the Lord. And he said unto him, if your presence go not with me, carry us not up thence. God, if you're not going to go, I don't want to go. I appreciate you saying you'll go and you'll be there, but let's get it straight, God. Your presence is not an added extra. It's not just an addition to what is necessary, but your presence is what is necessary. And so if you're not going to go, I don't want to go. I wonder how many things would change in our life if we would simply make up our minds God if your presence won't go with me if your presence won't be there I'm not going to go and I'm not necessarily talking about sinful activity right now I'm talking about places we find ourselves being attracted and drawn to places that are convenient to our flesh but places that we are separated from his presence but if like Moses we would say God I appreciate you you say and you'll go but I just want to establish one thing I don't want to go anywhere without your presence and something else I don't want to do is I don't want to substitute hype and human emotion and great programs for your presence We are in a dangerous time because we're at a point in time, if you're not careful and spiritual, spiritually discerning, you can be quickly deceived. Because if you're not careful, you can mistake talent and ability for anointing. Just because somebody's got a great voice, just because somebody know how to pl knows how to play an instrument well, just somebody, just because somebody knows how to preach, none of that is synonymous with anointing. That is not by default a stamp of God's approval. I, I, I really, I don't want to be critical or judgmental. And if it comes across that way, I'm, I'm very sorry. But I, I get so tired of watching. Uh, I, I, I guess I should just stop. But I, I guess I like to torment myself some. I don't know. And I, I get so tired of watching these two and three minute clips on, on Facebook and YouTube and whatever of, of preaching. That first of all, every message is the same. Devil's fighting you because you're about to step into your destiny. That's, 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 I mean, you're on the verge. You're all hell's breaking loose because you're on the verge. Let's skip the fact that you've never taken time to stop by the altar and let some things die. Let's skip the fact that you just got up out of a bed of adultery last night, got up out of the bed of fornication last night, and have walked right into the presence of God, and all hell's breaking loose because you're about to step into your destiny. If you've spent some time here, 
If you've let some things die here and all hell's still breaking loose, you probably ought to shout and dance a little bit because it could very well be that God has given the enemy the chance to interfere one more time before he shows up. But if you haven't made sure that everything that needs to die has died, don't blame the devil. we're not careful we can learn how to do all of this and miss that we don't have this I realize not exactly what it was all about but I think there was a principle in the fact that Mary left Jesus at the temple three days it took three days to realize somebody is missing. I guess because it was a different day and time. My kids were 12 and younger, and we were in a public place. It wasn't more than usually three seconds that we were making a check. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. Oh my God. She went three days and didn't know Jesus wasn't with her. I wonder how many times we go three days and have no idea Jesus isn't with us. Because when I skip this, I start to become insensitive. I start to become callous and it becomes harder and harder for me to recognize that he's not with me. If you don't go with me, I don't want to go. I want you to listen. Many of you know this story. But just as one simple example of the significance of the presence of God. 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God. The ark had been taken from the children of Israel. And so David has gone to get it. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Somebody say a new cart. Let's do it a little different than the way we used to do it. Let's, let's improve upon the past. I, I realize that we sing a lot of songs now that we didn't used to sing. I know there's a lot of new songs and, and we sing less of the older songs. And, and I understand that, but don't mistake the fact that just because some of that changes, we are not changing out methods. Because we can't substitute a new cart for old ways. We can't substitute a new way of doing it for an old way that God established. That doesn't, we, 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 we may change a little bit of how we go about it, but we're not improving upon what God established because you cannot improve upon God's way and they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah and Uzzah and Ohio the sons of Abinadab drave the new cart and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab which was at Gibeah accompanying the ark of God and Ohio went out went before the ark and David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals that means when the presence of god is around most of the time there ought to be some excitement 
there ought to be celebration. There ought to be joy. There ought to be singing and dancing and worshiping and praising out of gratitude and thanksgiving that the presence of God is with us. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. Isn't that amazing? David got upset with God for doing something God said he would do. He said in advance, don't touch it. Here's how I want you to handle it. And so if you're going to do it your way, and I don't respond to your way, don't get upset with me. If you're going to try to fit God into your way, when you're going to try to fit God into your mold, don't get upset with God when He doesn't fit. David was displeased with the Lord. Verse 9, And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him in the city of David. But David carried it aside in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. What changed? What changed in the house of Obed-Edom that all of a sudden it became blessed? He just simply became the storage place for the presence of God. And as a result of that, the Bible says that his house, that all his household was blessed. And it was told King David saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him. Why? What has changed in the house of Obed-Edom? One thing, the ark of God. (laughs) The ark of God was put in his house and his house was transformed. That's the power of the presence of God. That's the power of just the presence of God is that simply by the presence of God coming into a house, it was transformed and blessing began to flow. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Obed-Edom... I don't think was doing something to position himself to get the ark. Seems to me like David was just kind of looking for some place to put it. And Obed-Edom was the spot. Isn't that amazing? Scripture tells us, you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Says he's not far from us. He, he can be found of us. We can search for him and find him. And yet Obed-Edom, I don't think, was really looking for him. By some, what seemed to be chance circumstances, the presence of God was put in his house. And yet his house was transformed By the presence of God. So the second part of this tonight is. I am confident. That most of you without much work. Can think of some people. That you would love to see. The presence of God. Impact their lives. This year. 
that you believe that if they could just have an encounter with his presence, their lives could be transformed. Part of the reason we can believe that is because many of us have personally experienced the change that takes place as a result of the presence of God being in our lives. I want you, if you would, on that other list, hopefully you've gotten the first one taken care of by now. I'm asking you, if you would, to write some names of some people. Maybe it's a backslider. Maybe it's somebody that's never been saved. But it's somebody that you are desirous of seeing their lives encounter the presence of God. While you're doing that, if you brethren would help me and move these things down to the floor, please. Here's what we are about to do. In just a few moments. I'm going to ask you if you would. As a, as a natural demonstration of a spiritual principle. Whatever it is that the Lord has impressed upon you to put on the altar. It's right down there. I'm going to ask you to come and lay that piece of paper on the altar as an act of faith that whatever it is that may be hindering your relationship with God, your walk with God, perhaps your ministry, that you're going to put it on the altar and you're going to let the fire consume it. So that every hindrance and every obstacle to you seeing the fulfillment of what God has for you as an individual would be removed. And then I'm going to ask you to take that list that you have on the altar. Excuse me, the ark. And I'm going to ask you to come lay it on this ark. And we're going to do this tonight, but what we're also going to do we may not do it every single week. But we're going to keep these names, these lists that you put on this ark in a moment. And as a part of our weekly prayer meetings, we may not do anything more than just lay our hands on the papers. We may not call out the names. But over the next several weeks and months, we are going to lift those names up before God, trusting that they will have an encounter with His presence. That like Obed-Edom experienced when God showed up at His house, in His household, did you notice what the verse said? It didn't just say Obed, didn't just say Obed Edom was blessed. It said all of his household. So we are going to trust and believe that not just individuals, but individuals and their households are going to be impacted by the presence of God. Some of you have got sons and daughters that are backslid. Some of you have got spouses. Some of you have got moms and dads. I'm asking you tonight. Nobody's going to be reading over these. Nobody's going to be publishing names. I'm challenging you tonight, in the next few moments, as an act of faith. That you would put those names 
on this ark as a demonstration of faith and request that God, I want your presence to impact this life. I want your presence, God, to bring about a change in this life. I want to ask you to do this as I feel like if some of you would be sensitive to the Holy Ghost right now, I believe God is talking to some of you and you need to spend a little bit of time at the altar. Some of you may not really feel that need. So I'm going to ask you as you, in just a moment, bring your paper in fact, I'm going to do it this way. If you, if you are acknowledging and you are feeling a draw of the Spirit of God, that there are some things you need to take some time here for a few moments at least to deal with on the altar, then I'm going to ask you to put the paper first on the ark and then put your paper on the altar. And then after you've put it on the altar, to find yourself a spot for a few moments. I'm, 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 I'm begging some of you tonight. There, there, there's, there's, there's a few of you. I, I don't really know who. It's just what I feel. But there's a few of you that if you don't get some things on the altar, you, you're not even going to be here at the end of 2017. I don't mean alive. I, I mean in a part of this body. And if you don't get some things on the altar and let the fire of the altar deal with them, you're not going to make it through this year still connected to this body. So I'm asking you on this first night as we begin a new year that if you've got some things that you really need to deal with on the altar, would you please take a Take a few moments at least tonight and spend some time making sure that not just sticking a piece of paper and walking away, but that truly between you and God, you would spend some time letting go of some things. This is probably going to be about as chaotic as our offering was, and I apologize, but if you would stand. They're actually going to lift the top of this ark off and you can just drop that paper down inside of it. That'll add to the privacy as we'll just put the top back on it and leave them there. You're welcome to begin to come. Please, I know this is a very simple thing, but as you're coming, would you just talk to the Lord? As you're coming with that list of names that you want God to touch this year, you want the presence of God to impact this year, would you talk to the Lord about it? When you lay some things on the altar, would you truly, truly lay them on the altar? God, I don't want anything to be in my life that's going to bring separation between you and me. I don't want there to be anything in my life, God, that's going to hinder me from accessing your presence. I don't want there to be anything that's going to come between you and me, God. Whatever it is, God, that may be in my life that has the potential of being a hindrance, an obstacle, to you and me, God, I want to lay it down tonight on the altar. And I want it to be consumed with the fire because I don't want to take the chance of picking it up again later. I don't want to take a chance of going back to it again later. I want to let go of it once and for all. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. 
y calabosa taramando lo vos a talabaya. God, I'm believing you. I'm trusting you tonight, God. That by faith, these individuals' names that are being placed in this box, God, that as a demonstration of desire and faith, God, that over the next couple of weeks and months, that your presence would impact those lives. God, that these lives would have an undeniable encounter with you. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would help us tonight as a church, that we would not fall into the trap of bypassing the altar to just get to the presence. That we would not ignore the need of the altar in our lives to just make our way to your presence. But God, that we would do what is necessary to lay those things on the altar. To allow those things to die that have the potential of being a wedge between you and us. Ultimately for our salvation, but also God, for things you've called us to do. Ministries that you've called us to. God, whatever it is we need to put on the altar so that there is no limitation on what you can do in us and through us. Help us to lay it down tonight. Help us to put offenses on the altar. Help us to put unforgiveness on the altar. Help us to put resentment on the altar. Help us to put our will on the altar. Help us, God, to even lay down some promises on the altar. And trust you, God, that even if you choose to let them die, that all things are working together for our good. In the name of Jesus, help us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto you as our reasonable service to not be conformed to this world but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus don't let us miss the ark don't let us miss the altar God don't let us bypass the altar and don't let us be insensitive to your presence but we're also asking you God to let your presence impact lives God, the challenges that we face in our world today, the difficulties that individuals are facing in their lives today, God, there's nothing that your presence doesn't have the power and the ability to overcome. I trust you, God. I trust you, God. God, you see every name. You see the name of every individual that's been placed in this heart, God. Whether backslider, sinner, whatever the condition is, you see the name. And I pray, God, that you would respond to our desire tonight. That you would respond to our request tonight. That your spirit would reach down and touch. That you would work and move in these lives, Lord, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. God, let everything that's been placed on this altar tonight 
in a symbolic way I pray that in a spiritual way God what has been done in the natural you would do in the spiritual that you would take these things that have been put on this altar tonight that they would be consumed by the fire of your spirit in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. God, I pray that in our lives individually over the next few days, that you would help us to build an altar, God an altar in our walk with you, an altar in our devotion. Not some small altar that stuck to the side of our lives, but as was the case with the brazen altar, that you couldn't miss it when you entered the tabernacle. God, let it be that we would create an altar in our life that we can't just overlook and bypass, but an altar that gets our attention so that we can make sure that we continually place on the altar what needs to be on the altar. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, hallelujah. If you're not standing and you're able to stand would you stand and here's I want us to join together and close with this focusing many of you've got loved ones names that you wrote down on that piece of paper tonight friends co-workers people that are very dear to you I want us to join together tonight with a focused prayer that God would begin to work in these lives of fresh and anew. I'm sure most of these lives, in fact, all of these lives, God's already working in. But in light of tonight, that God would do a fresh and a new work. Would you join me with that? God, right now, you know every individual God, every name, it's been written down tonight. We're asking you, God, right now. I pray, God, that even at this very moment, there would be those that would recognize a touch of your spirit, even right now, God. No matter where they are, no matter what they're doing, that in, even in this very moment, God, Especially those, Lord, that have experienced in the past the touch of your Spirit. That even now, God, seemingly out of nowhere, they would feel that gentle touch of your presence. That they would feel the love and compassion, the wooing of your Spirit, God. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I trust you, God, that you will consume tonight what we have put on the altar. And I trust you that you will bless what we have placed in this ark as a statement of faith. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you if you're still praying and want to continue praying. Obviously, you're welcome to do that if you need, want to go. Welcome to go as well.